to This is ADHD. I'm your host, Chris Johnson. I started this podcast in 2023 as a way to celebrate ADHD Awareness Month. I wanted to do something different and have genuine conversations with real people about the experience of having ADHD and what life looks like. Through these conversations, I use my professional coaching skills and we have conversations that jump around all over the place. I hope you enjoy this conversation. And if you look at the end, there's ways to reach out and contact me and talk about the podcast. Thank you for listening. Welcome to This is ADHD. Today I am joined by Lisa. She is a late diagnosed woman um, from Colorado, Denver. Uh, she is a manager at a nonprofit. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing? Good to see you, Chris. I've been looking forward to this. So, Lisa. What do you call your ADHD? I don't know that I have a name for it yet. Mm. It's still fairly new to me, much like you. So I'm reading mm. a lot about it. But I guess if I had to name it anything, a descriptive of anything, an opportunity to better understand my brain. Love that. And my place in the world. Absolutely love that. What a way to take it on. Oh, opportunity. Oh, I'm going to come back to that. I'll okay. ask you more about that. Mm -hmm. um, but before I do, I want to ask you kind of how you went from non-ADHD to ADHD. What was the what was the warning signs and how did you kind of go from there to here? I think the biggest thing is I thought, um, and I still have like, there's still like questions there. Is how much is CPTSD and how much is ADHD or both combined together? But for me, there were de definite, now that I look back, such strong signs. But I booked it into my anxiety. And I was always like, how do I become less anxious? I need to meditate more. Maybe if I meditate all the time, 24-7, maybe that will help. But for me, a big thing was coming out of the pandemic. My company during the pandemic made the decision to go fully remote. So we still have an office that. But coming out of the pandemic, I'd spent so much time where I wasn't masking that when I would be around people, my ability to mask, it's almost like it, I, I ran into a wall where it's like I knew I was supposed to, like something subconscious was saying mask, but there wasn't an ability to, so the anxiety got even worse. And I literally like couldn't finish sentences couldn't think of words, couldn't think of people all was standing in front of names, just, and I would bring that back, and all of that, it was just such a mess, and when I was talking to people, I was talking so quickly, even, even remote, doing more like webinars, I was talking so quickly, talking over myself, over people, and again, forgetting what I was trying to say, or the five miles ahead of the conversation and trying to bring it there was just so many things there and what happened was i i my doctor had me see a psychiatrist because as i mentioned to you um off webinar i i too have uh, i have a lot of back issues um and it's my si joint but now maybe my hips we don't know it's a big discovery thing but now i've seen now i've Due to nerves, I, I'm like going blank. So I, I was going to, I was looking to go on Lyrica, which is a medication that helps a lot with neuro, neurologic, they find um, neurological pain, that this can help because my pain was so constant. So it seemed, uh, my doctor made me see their psychiatrist. As I'm talking to the psychiatrist during our first meeting, ADHD came up. And he kept mentioning it, and I kept pushing it off. And it was actually the next meeting or the meeting after that, he, he kept mentioning it every time we met. And then he's like, I'd like to try some of this medication. You need to get an EKG, blah, blah, blah. And I put off the EKG for like 45 days. And 
you know, all these things that I was like doing that that's when it started to occur to me that maybe I need to figure out this ADHD thing a little more. And I started on threads and as I was looking through threads, all these people came up that were like telling me that, you know, say, not telling me, but saying they just discovered late diagnosis and everything like that. So I grabbed onto that. So pre-ADHD, it was like, what was wrong? What's wrong with me? Why am I so, what's wrong with me? You know, where is my malfunction? How do I fix my malfunction? Which I've been doing all my life is trying to figure out where my malfunction is and how I'm supposed to fix it. So I've been on this lifelong journey figure out why I don't fit and what I'm doing wrong. And then, um, you know, as I learn more about ADHD and executive function thinking, things become more clear. Things are more clear. And I'm much more forgiving with myself lately. I will say that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear that a lot. And I, I feel that a lot of if you don't know you have ADHD, it's your fault. Mm-hmm. Like you've got neurological condition which makes you act in certain ways and if you can't put a label on it or understand why it's happening then it must be a flaw in your personality a failing of you personally that's a lot to carry our society is set up so that we fit a very tight box Mm. which fits a comfort level because the expectation is put out that everybody fits this tight box but I never fit that box. And again, it goes back to CTP, CPT, SD. Now I can't even, PSTD. I, what do I have? Anyway, it goes back to that and, and like thinking, oh, okay, so I got to fix what was messed up when I was a child, but I don't know how to do that. And then it's that constant reminder that, I don't fit. Everybody has that suggestion of what to do so that you can fit the box better. But those suggestions either didn't work for me, were uncomfortable for me, not who I was, but I didn't know I had a right to figure out who I was and become that. So there's almost, I mean, I hear about people saying, you know, I'm angry and I'm bitter and and I do have anger, but about, you know, not knowing this, you know, prior earlier when I was a kid, maybe my young 20s, maybe, you know, so I could understand better. But really, would it have made, would it have happened? Given where society was during those times, it wouldn't have done any good. And this is where I am now. And and I am thankful to have a better understanding of myself, which also gives me a better understanding that other people don't think like me either. You know, like I'm a manager. And so Maybe my training styles and things, I do them according to what I've experienced. But some people may think I'm going too much into detail. Maybe some people are thinking that I'm simplifying it too much and they're like, hey, I got this. Why are you talking to me like I don't get one plus one? Um, Because I was always, I've always been about like, I experienced this and this is how it affected me. So I do not want other people to experience this. So what can I do different so that I don't put people in that position? But the thing is, is that if I think different than a lot of people, then there's a disconnect even there. So, yeah, for me, ADHD, is it, it is such an opening, and I have so much more to learn about it. But I think the most important thing is understanding that the way I think and the way I do things not only is okay for me, but it's a blessing for me to understand that. I no longer have to follow that. I, all my life, I was like, where's the, where's the lesson book? Where are the rules for living life on society's terms? I don't understand how these people knew all this stuff, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I, I love that you kind of brought it back without any prompting back to this opportunity to learn your brain. <laughs> and so, something that I, I'm reflecting on and I don't know if this resonates with you, and if it's if it's not, then feel free to kind of say this is not the thing. But something that I've noticed, reflection of my life in, in therapy and with my coaches, is just how low my ego is, and like my sense of self-preservation, of saying actually, 
number one priority is whoever is not me. I don't know if that's going to factor into your journey at all. Yeah, my life. I mean, I have spent my entire life trying to prove, I thought to other people, but really it's to myself, that I have a right to be here. I spent my life feeling like I was born already in the negative, and I've been working my ass off being that supportive, service-oriented, do-anything-I-can-for-everybody-else person just looking to, for the opportunity to get out of the hole I thought I was born in. So I think that's just, I don't know if other people with ADHD have felt this way, but I think that's just so important to understand. But I think a lot of people, when I'm reading with ADHD, a lot of people have trauma. I mean, everybody has trauma to a level, but the trauma I experienced as a child was so ongoing and consistent that it shaped my brain as well. And I don't know. So I don't know, like, did my ADHD tendencies increase due to the trauma? Was the trauma that first, you know, my reaction to the trauma was that also an ADHD? I don't know. Egg, you know, egg, chicken, chicken, egg. I don't know. But one thing that I will say is that whether it was a pandemic or, so I also had, you know, I had perimenopause and the menopause and, 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 there are, in reading for women, there are very, they're very, I mean, everybody is affected by their hormones, even more so for women with ADHD. And um, I don't know if everything became so acute and so out in my face because of the pandemic, you know, all of those things. I don't know, but this is where I am right now. I, I have spent so much of my life like I said, trying to prove myself throughout my life. And, and I mentioned this to you before, that if I look at my life, like it was like I was almost like the best way to describe me, like a bullet. I just was pushing myself through everything, forcing, trying to be the good girl, trying to be perfection. Everything I did had to be right. And, and it just, Everything exacerbated everything else, the anxiety, the inability to understand why I was trying so hard and I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere. It's exhausting, you know, and you don't think you can give up. You can't let go of it because, you know, this is something that's, you know, I, yeah. I have only recently post-diagnosis learned what perfectionism is. Because I assumed it was doing things really well. I didn't realize it was the thing of striving for a standard that was constantly out of reach. I was saying, actually, my standards are just really high. And no one can meet my standards. I can't meet my own standards. Of going, actually, that's, are, your, are your standards actually perfectionism? Of looking at that and churning away on that hamster wheel to kind of get to a point of going like, well, it's, I, I've never achieved what I wanted to in the right way. Mm -hmm. Absolute failure. There's that binary. What I'd always hear from people, and I still do to this day, is how I always presented myself. People would say that I'm intimidating, that I appear intimidating in the beginning until they get to know me and they realize that I'm just this total geek nerd. But... Um, because I didn't realize it at the time, but I was, people thought I was every hair in place, all the right clothes, you know, and, and, and even like making my bed every morning, because it's not, perfectionism is not just doing one thing perfect, it's everything involved, because if I could do it all perfect, then maybe I could get out of the hole, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's that thinking that if it's not just right, that you didn't do it right at all. Mm. Yeah. There's a failure, yeah, uh, and therefore proof is why you're not good enough. I don't know if I've made this point on another episode, but I don't care. It's, it's salient now, so <laughs> um, I, I have noticed 
in groups. Um, so I, I'm a fairly outgoing ADHD. -er. I'll go and talk to people. I'll ask questions and be a bit nosy. Um, and people see me talking about ADHD, so they come talk about ADHD. And the amount of people that I've been in groups with who I have thought that they are the most on point, the most achieving, and then they go, yeah, I'm neurodivergent and I'm really struggling. I'm like, I think there's this thing of like the, this neurotypical line that we all aspire for as neurodivergence, and they're going, I'm going to be so neurotypical, you can't even tell that I'm not one of them. That's exactly it. We are struggling to become that which our brain is not set up to become. And so we are constantly feeling like we're failures, we're not good enough, because we can't get into that headspace, because it's not possible. And we can't understand it. And we can't even see their perception because it's not possible. So we're looking at everything, everything through this perception. Of, well, for me, it was, okay, so I pay attention to media. And to, cause I was highly isolated as a child. So if I pay attention to media and to see in movies, this will show me how to be a person. And instead, it showed me how to be the perfect neurotypical person which has a lot of angst and anxiety for me, I can say. <laughs> but um, I still was fighting for it. Like, I just believed if I tried hard enough. My heart was in it, you know? Mm. Like, And, you know, TV, movies show that to you. If your heart's in yep. it, you'll win. And we never got there. And now yeah, I'm finding it, out, you know, maybe there's another path. Maybe there's another perception. Yeah, if you just keep stalking that girl one more week, you totally won't get sent to prison. You really see how amazing you are. <laughs> I'm still say yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Hollywood has got I a mean, lot to answer. I mean, it's so true. I've hung on to... Yeah. But I've hung on to relationships that were damaging to me for so long. I've hung on to, you know, like, you know, getting involved in yoga. I, I've hung on to things way past the due date and forced myself to keep going through it because I thought that's what it was supposed to do. And never once have I been able to, or have I taken the time to say, what is right for me now? Now, I have gone through, or I'm going through still, um, burnout. So there's been a lot more time. I mean, if you knew, like, on the weekend, being so exhausted, I could barely move and beating myself up for it. And during the weekdays, I was getting up at 4.30 in the morning, going for a run, coming back, getting into work early, working 10, 10 11 hours, coming home, crashing, and that was my work week. And I was on the whole time I was at work, and then I'd come back, and on the weekend, when I should have just been resting most of that time was spent this anxiety of not accomplishing some great project on the weekend like i it just messed up it was just there was just a lot of bad things that i was doing to myself that i didn't know it um, because i didn't know how to even accept myself i didn't even know who i was and i still don't 100 percent know that i don't i'm still working on it but i am Accepting things about myself, which I never did before. I accept that I'm creative. I accept that I have artistic um, tendencies. I fully accept that I'm an introvert. I'm accepting more things about myself now and giving myself so much more grace, but I still have high expectancies of myself. You know, like, should I have mastered the ADHD thing by now? You know what I mean? It's been six, six, seven months. You know, um, what I was saying was like uh, my mental health metaphor de jour is what is it? It's mental health is like a house, like you're never done with your house. Like you might paint the walls, you might change the furniture, you might do this, you might do that, and that's good for now. And you've got to keep working on your house because this is the place that you live, but it's mm -hmm. never going to be finished. But the thing is, is I've got to make sure that foundation solid first, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, kind of do all the additions and the sparklies and the, you know, the rooftop verandas and all those 
things. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what a water veranda is now. <laughs> yeah, I think because we're all like on this journey as well. I hate, I hate the word journey. Everyone uses the word journey. What's the journey? Uh, but there's that thing of like, hey, I'm still, still progressing, still learning things. But I now, what's this? Yeah, six months after diagnosis. Um. And more mentally resilient than I have ever been. And I'm, as we kind of mm. talked about off camera, I'm going through some tough times at the moment, it's lots of change. But I have confidence in myself, which is something that I've never had. And part of that is the acceptance. It's so funny that we have to accept we already are. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's a crazy concept. Yeah. That you would think you would be born accepting all of that we have to accept that which we already are that that is not it's a steadfast thing you know mm. and and it is i i i too am feeling more confident in myself because now i can like test thoughts ideas concepts without that test immediately going to is that what society says is okay mm -hmm. i can test them for myself if it's okay for me, I can live, it's that recognition that I can live a life that is good for me. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to mess up, exactly mess up to what everyone says. You know? When I say what everyone says, you know, it's the general concept of, you know, oh, yeah. you're, you you recognize yourself as being a woman, therefore let me tell you what things are going to be like, you know, and, uh, or, or, or let me make sure you're checking up all the boxes. And I don't, I don't even look at the boxes anymore. I mean, now it's, it's a matter of learning to trust my own self, which is something I never could do before. Um, um, because my own self was different from what everybody else was telling me. So now trusting my own self it's a whole nother thing out there. What were you going to say? I was just going to say, I've said these stats before and everyone says these stats, but there's this thing about not trusting yourself, not liking yourself. Um, and as children, we have one way friendships. Like statistically, we are more likely to have one way friendships where we have friends with someone who is not our friend. And the average ADHD child has 20,000 more negative comments by the time they're is it 12 is it 10 than an average child as well so we are told subconsciously and actively by our peers and by our adults around us even in regular conversations and even in regular childhoods without trauma that we are different and we are not right we don't fit mm. i uh have tales of people setting me up like you know come on lisa we'll be friends with you and then all counting to three and running away from me on the playground and you know i spent much of my elementary years sitting against the brick wall reading i mean reading was my life i walked to school with a book i read by moonlight that was that was the place where i could sit was in my you know in a book I recognize that in myself. Like, I had that escape into literature because it's quiet, it's no trouble. Yeah. And if you're quiet and you're no trouble, then nothing's going to go wrong, right? And it's also, you get praised for reading. Them. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it would be interesting to find out because of that for a lot of ADHDers, like, how much that played a part, too in, in mm. when our brain was forming as a child. That if I'm quiet, if I stay in the background, I won't have trouble. Mm. And I won't be there. You know? So and then as a woman, as a female, especially back when I was a child and stuff, there was a very clear delineation of what the boys do and what the girls do. And so that masking had to come early, 
you know, like, um, I haven't been given like a, you're a combo or you're the hyperactivity or, but I think I'm combination because there's so much on both sides that fit me. Um, and, but as a female, I, since I was struggling so hard to just fit in anyway, um, disappearing into the woodwork was the best way to handle everything always, every time. Quiet, in the background, don't make waves, smile and nod, always be willing to be helpful. And then you have that perfection and perfectionism in there. And to what you said about so many of our friends not really it being a one-sided friendship, and that's exactly what it was. I was the friend that everybody depended on to take care of everything. And I have been there for years. I can tell you stories all the way up to, like, close friends getting married. And I was not in the wedding party, but I was running around the day of the wedding, getting together waters and food and all these things. And then I helped her put on her dress. And every time the photographer would show up, I would bow down out of the picture. But I was the one that was there doing all the background work. And that's an example of who I was most of my life. I was in the background doing the work and knowing someone else was going to get the great job. You look great. That worked out really well. I have a near exact same story. And the funny thing is, you do. Yeah, I do. you do. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, yeah. Just, a few, a few you know, years ago. Yeah, you believe I mean, it? It's, it's, like it's like we're trying to prove our place in every second of every day. Yeah, and I want to say, like, regular people feel that as well. They go, "Yeah, we can totally ask Chris to do this. Totally ask him." Mm-hmm. And I'm going to relate back to the story. Totally ask him to organize the stag do yeah. and organize the venue and do all of this, but not come to the wedding. Totally. And he'll be fine with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we can't afford for you to be there. So mm. yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Nice. Yeah. Or, or the bride will barely acknowledge you as she's busy with her wedding. And mm. you spent the day making sure she was perfect. And everybody was dead and everybody had water and I was opening water bottles and handing them to people I don't even know and you know I'm like but that was me and that is me still yeah. um, we just had a holiday party for um, and, and we had it at a venue and with my SI joint affecting my legs makes me have to walk with a cane at times Stood at the entrance the entire party and made sure as the people came in, they got their drink tokens, they understood like where everything was, and they under, you know, like they felt welcome. And, you know, I, that's what I did. I didn't eat, I didn't, you know, and that's still me. I still think that I'm only as good as what I'm giving. Yeah. I mean, a lot there, of is a lot. there is a lot of heaviness. <laughs> <laughs> I think I want to go back to this opportunity that you called mm-hmm. your ADHD, the opportunity mm-hmm. to understand yourself and mm-hmm. the self-acceptance. And how is that kind of showing up for you, like on a day-to-day basis? Because we, we say self-acceptance, we say emotional acceptance is brilliant. And then you go like, but what is it? I'm getting better. There is a sense of, um, there is a freeing element to it in that as I learn more about myself and how to accept myself, I'm allowing the old speak, that voice in the head that consistently reminds me that I'm probably missing something, that I probably screwed something up, that I check all the, you know, did I do all the things, and did I do it all right and stuff. I'm letting myself let go so much more than I've ever been able to in my life. And that's freeing. I would, what I really desire is to find out more. And for me, just like diagnose people's stories and and like their full stories, and as well as more like like diagnose women's stories and experiences too, to see how it 
it comes up different. I think the hardest thing, too, is describing myself without needing everybody's, like, sign-off, you know? I don't need people to tell me I'm kind in order to know that I'm kind. There's still a lot of other things that I still need, and I'm still affected by people's thoughts and opinions, and 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 I still compare myself to different levels of society and stuff. But I am always having to rem- I'm always reminding myself that forgiveness level of like one thing that I think will be good, maybe will helpful for you too, is I look back at. When I was a child into adulthood leading up to now, uh, I look at the challenges that I didn't know I had, that I was working through and dealing with and trying to get through and understand and everything. And I can tell you this, I'm a fucking rock star when it comes to, to resilience. And that's yeah. one thing that I think we as people who are neurodivergent have is we are resilient rock stars because we've made it this far without even really knowing what was going on. And even if we had known what was going on, in a world that, I mean, only recently started recognizing it and accepting, having any level of acceptance of it, you know, that makes us resilient rock star. And sometimes I have to remind myself of that. Like if I look at the big freaking picture, I got something to say. Yeah. I think it's that thing of like everything you've achieved in your life, you've achieved in your life whilst having ADHD and like carrying around and looking like everyone else and doing things in a way that does not work for you and still succeeding. And carrying around all the past weight of the failures that we caught of our own, like we're not good enough, the past weight of how we felt about ourselves while doing all of that. Like we were born with luggage. You know, they yeah. talk about people carrying <laughs> their... We were born with a full fat man. Yeah. Yeah. It's that thing of like we are born with different brains and we are born mm-hmm. wired differently to hear criticism differently to react differently and then the the world that we were born into did not recognize our brains and so we were born with all this difference but also with the lessons of there is no difference and that it's our choice it's our choice to be stop being so why are you so hyper god you've got a lot of energy why can't you know or why are you just sitting there what are you lazy? Like all these different things that came to us, we carried with that on top of having the different brain. Yeah. yeah. Because people still don't see ADHD, still don't see neurodivergence, and they don't understand. And they see a behavior and they assume a motive. They see, for example, like a really simple one, like ghosting. A negative ghost. motive. Yeah, exactly. That thing of like, you didn't do this because of I was like no I didn't do this because I have ADHD yeah yeah or yeah people don't want to hear that (laughs) no no they don't you know only people who have had direct experience of it currently have an understanding or an acceptance around it you know whether it's somebody in there close to them somebody they work with or themselves or someone in their family it they don't it doesn't make sense to them because their brains (laughs) fit the norm <laughs> so their brains fit the norm doesn't everyone else's and i think it's that thing of what was it oh, laziness laziness and i mm. think there's i didn't realize that laziness was choosing to not do something and choosing to do something that you wanted to do instead as opposed to the inability to do the thing that you want to do because those look like the same thing externally Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're right. You're completely right. Yeah. I, this weekend, instead of playing video games, I spent an hour and a half picking stickers off of a window, which I didn't need to do because <laughs> that's what I got stuck into. <laughs> oh, I'll show you. <laughs> like, and then once you get into it, you're like, I can't. Stop. Oh, 
Wait, there's exactly. one more. Exactly. Did not need to do it. Did not want to do yeah. it, but I was in it and I was getting dopamine from it, so let's keep doing it. <laughs> right? Yeah. You're like, well, now that I've, I'm going to clean, this window's going to be freaking looking brand new when I'm done. <laughs> right, right. So that's and how I spent like, my what Saturday What are like, tools I need to get the stickers <laughs> off? What do I have? Yep. Yeah. Totally understand you. Yeah. I just didn't understand why I was tired, but I always had so much energy. Mm, yeah. And the energy is like almost a nervous energy, but then the tired could be a stopping everything. Tired. Like mm. people don't even sleep. Yeah. Um, I've written, I think I said, I've written a newsletter about this, which comes up mm -hmm. this week, which will tell you, tell people who are listening to this in the future when this was recorded um, about being tired. And I, for one of them as well, I think we talked about it already, was masking. And I think there's, mm -hmm. so I, I move around a lot, as you can see on, on the video if you're watching. But if mm -hmm. I force myself to hold still, I am constantly checking and making sure that I'm not through myself. So I had four and a half days of meetings last week, eight hour meetings, a little long. And for most of them, I was totally fine. Because I got up, I stood, I walked around, I was just mm -hmm. like ADHD. I'm, I'm not engaging. And one of them was four hours. I forgot that I was meant to be doing the ADHD thing, and I did the old masking thing, and I sat there, and I realised I was literally sat there like this, mm -hmm. listening, holding myself to stop mm -hmm. myself from moving. And it's like I, actually, I'm just holding myself. I'm putting myself into a tense position. Of course I'm going to be tired at the end of that day. There's more energy to stop myself doing the things than it is to just do the things. Yes. Yes, because it's almost, it's natural to do the stuff, you know? Yeah. Like, my thing is rocking. Mm. I usually am constantly rocking. If I'm standing, I'm definitely going to be rocking back and forth. Um, I'll be ro rocking a leg. I'll be, uh, but my thing is just that. Like rocking, constantly moving things. And for meetings, it's still really difficult for me to sit through a meeting. Even if I'm like not on camera, it's still difficult. But if if I can go back and listen to it, if it was recorded, I can totally zone in, mm. shut out the world, and like take great notes and stuff like that. Um but for some reason, when I'm actually supposed to be actively present, like I, there's, I too much. Like it's almost like I have to hold myself, like holding myself in that, that look like you're listening place is, yeah. like you said, even more uncomfortable, even more energy sucking than actually if I'm like doodling or, mm. you know, whatever, then I can yeah. hold when you listen. But I can't, yeah. I can't just put it all into one thing. Yeah. And I wouldn't I wonder if that is a hard conversation to have with bosses. Um, for people who are listening who are saying, Do you want me to know. be do you want me to look like I'm listening or do you want me to listen? Luckily I, I, I spend a lot of time not putting on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> um but what was I gonna say along the lines of always moving, listening. I have all these notes that I put and I was like, don't look at your notes too much because it's a flowing conversation and oh, hypervigilance, speaking of like Ooh. listening and things like that. Um, yeah. I'm super hypervigilant. So like I'm super observed. I observe everything. I think part of that comes from constantly observing people to understand how to like how to be a part of whether it's a meeting or anything else, but it's also being hyper vigilant on myself to not make a mistake, not say the wrong thing, not do the wrong thing, being. That's why even like, you know, that holiday party where I sat and just, or I stood and just like welcomed everybody. I do much better in a social situation if I have a job to do. Mm. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you'll find me in some corner somewhere, unless there's a pet, in which case I'll be in the corner with the pet. I think okay. there's something about security and safety and... Quiet. Yeah. 
where I'm not, where I don't feel like I'm on. I think that that's it. I think that trying to fit in, trying to be a part of whatever it was turning on. And when I'm on, I'm not completely comfortable. I can't get completely comfortable because I'm attempting to be something versus just being me and letting life flow. And I think that for years and years, I was just on all the time. Like I couldn't fall asleep because I couldn't turn off because my mind was like, you know, don't mess it up. Rethinking conversations or meetings or things I've said or what I wrote or how I presented. It was just always being on and never just being. And so was it real, you know? It was a part of me, but was, you know, have I been fully real all my life? And that's got to take an impact. Huh? Sorry, that's got that's got to take an impact. It's, it's exhausting, you know, um, trying to make up for something that I want. And being so afraid to find out about it because there's got to be something wrong with it. I, I'm a, definitely, definitely afraid to find out because then that means it's all true. Yeah. And that's another thing that, like, getting this kind of a diagnosis is like saying it's all good, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, it's challenges, but here's the thing. It's just challenges. In this world right now, with these this society and these people, but the opportunity is to understand myself so much better and to see what I can do with it. And like being on this podcast, like what can I say that maybe will trigger something that will help someone else? Like what can we do for each other? How do we make it okay for each other to be ourselves? Mm-hmm. The great thing about dogs is no matter what you are, they're completely accepting of it. <laughs> I, I am sh- sure that I have had ADHD dogs in the past. <laughs> Believe it. Yep. So we're ne- we're nearly at the end, Lisa. Um, mm-hmm. So I think I've got like one or two more questions, and I think the question I want to ask you is: if you were talking to yourself twenty years ago, what would you say, given the learnings that you've had? I could really like say to myself is you are okay with exactly who you are, and you just think different than other people. Go with it. And there's no such thing as lazy. Fucking hate lazy. So, Lisa, have you got anything that you wanted to kind of mention? Any recommendations? So, I don't have any specific books or readings. I've just been grabbing everything that I can grab, and I've been reading things. And um, I think the biggest thing I would say is keep investigating. And also, it's really important for us to tell our story. So that at the very least, we each can hear them and understand that they're real. Yeah. I've just written down, this is not the end. because Yeah. Oh, look, it's the the death one. (laughs) Looking out the window right now. Well, with our second guest appearing. That's our little puggle. Let's close there. there. No. (gasps) Thank you so much for your time, Lisa. (laughs) Thank you.